Alright. Congressional behavior. First of all, let's review what does constituency mean? The people that people that what? They represent. That they represent. The people that are congressmen, the House of Representatives, and the Senate represent. The House of Representatives, they represent what? People from from districts, while well, senators represent people from an entire what? An entire state. So who has a more diverse constituency, a senator or a House of Representative member? A senator, right, because he has to represent an entire state, while a House of Representative member only has to represent a portion of that state. If you live in states like Wyoming, for example, where you only have one district, then it's the same diversity. So constituency means the people that a uh, representative or a congressman represents, a House of Representative member represents a district, which is a portion of a state usually, and a senator represents an entire state. There's many different models in how representatives should behave themselves as representatives in the U.S. Congress, and these models you need to know because they're always a question on AP exams. There's three known models of congressional behavior in the United States. First one you need to remember is the trustee model. As a trustee, the trustee model calls for a congressman to be trusted by his constituency to make the correct decisions for his or her constituents. So, in a trustee model, the congressman, the person that's representing the people, he is trusted to make the correct decisions. But even if those decisions Go against what? Go against the majority of his constituents. He is trusted to make the decision anyway. That's why he's called a trustee. He's supposed to make the correct decisions for his constituents. Not necessarily just follow his constituents blindly, sometimes even ignoring the wants and the needs of his constituents. So he is trusted to make the, the best decisions, even if those decisions would go against the majority of his constituents. He's supposed to make the decision himself based on what he believes would be best for his constituents even if that decision would go against the will of the majority of his constituents. Alright, so I'll give you an example. Who's, uh, who's one of our senators here in Texas? Who represents you guys in the Senate? Uh, Ted Cruz is one of them. He's our senator in, in the United States Congress. Let's say, according to a recent poll, 90% of Texans want abortion to be restricted in the United States. But Ted Cruz, he doesn't believe this, but let's say Ted Cruz believes that abortion shouldn't be restricted. He believes that's the best decision. So what does he do? Does he go with his own convictions or does he follow his constituents? If he's a trustee, what does he do? Sorry? He goes with his own and he would go against the majority of his constituents. Because he is trusted to make the correct what? The correct decisions. He's not just well, blindly following his constituents, he's supposed to make the good, the, the correct decisions. Which type of democracy, out of all the three models that we talked about, which type of democracy is elite, participatory, or pluralist? Elite. This is elite. That these representatives are supposed to be the best among us, and they're supposed to be the one making the, um, the correct decision, even if those decisions goes against what their constituency wants. Our opinions are filtered through them, and they're supposed to make the good decisions, the correct policy. The opposite of that would be the delegate model. In the delegate model, you are a puppet. You are a mouthpiece for who? For your constituents. You are there to represent them as best as you can. They hold your strings. The decisions that you make are not based on what you believe in, what, not based on what you think is correct, not based on your values, but based on what who wants? Your constituency wants. Based on what your district wants or based on what your state wants. You are merely a puppet for your constituents. You are there in Congress to represent your constituents, to do what they want you to do, to vote according to how they want you to vote. 
you are not making the decision yourself. You are basing your decision off of what your constituency wants. So you are a mouthpiece. You make decisions based on your, the majority of your constituents. And sometimes you ignore who? You ignore yourself. You bury yourself deep down. You ignore your values. You ignore your beliefs because that's not what you're there for. You're there to represent your constituents. You're going to make decisions. Um, sometimes those decisions might go against what you believe in. Because you're not there for you, you're there for your constituents. You're there to represent what they want. You will ignore yourself sometimes, ignore what you believe in sometimes. So what type of democracy is this? We're giving a lot of influence on for to who? The people, right? We're giving a lot of influence to the constituents. So this is what? This is participatory. Or you are merely a robot programmed by your constituents. Your constituents have a lot of influence over the decisions that you make. All right, so let's take a wall bill, for example. Congress is talking about a bill that would give funding for a wall. You are a senator in, in state X. State X, according to the recent poll, favors, 75% of them favors the wall. If you are practicing the trustee model, how do you make your decision? Based on who? Based on yourself. And if you believe that the wall is not a good idea, do you vote yes or no? You vote no. Even if that, that goes against your what? Your constituents, because they trust you to make the correct decision for them. If you are practicing the delegate model, how do you vote? The way your constituency wants you to vote. And in this case, since they support the wall, are you also going to support the wall? Yes, you are. Because you are merely a puppet for your constituents. You are a mouthpiece for your constituents. Does that make sense? Even if, so that sometimes means ignoring who? Ignoring yourself. Any questions on that? All right. Now, most congressmen in Congress are neither trustees nor delegates. They don't practice these two models. They're a combination of both, and that is what we call a politico. Politicos are a combination of a trustee and a delegate, where sometimes they go according to what their constituency wants, ignoring themselves, but sometimes they go with what they believe in, ignoring their constituents. All right, so when do they usually practice trustee model and the delegate model? It depends on the issue, and it depends how their constituents feel about that issue. If your constituents feel very strongly about the issue, if they really, really are passionate about a certain issue, you're probably going to practice what? Delegate or trustee? Delegate, because you want to follow them there, because if they're very passionate about it and you vote the wrong way, what are they going to do to the next election? No. They're not going to vote for you. But if they don't really care about an issue, even if 90% of them supports gay marriage, for example, but they don't really care about it, they're not strongly passionate about the issue, there's more room to practice what? Trustee or delegate? Trustee. There's more room to decide for yourself, because they're not going to punish you for it, because they don't really care about it as much. Does that make sense? It depends on how passionate your constituents feel about an issue. If they're very passionate about it, then you probably want to go with them, so you practice the delegate model. If they don't really care about an issue, then you have more room to exercise your own beliefs and your own values, so you're going to be a trustee. Any questions? Again, you don't want to get punished the next election if the constituents really care about a certain issue. Like in Texas, for example, social issues like gay marriage and abortions, those are very um, passionate issues for, for constituents, so that's something that you may want to go with your constituents on. All right, moving on. Redistricting. This is our main topic today. This is what we're going to spend the rest of the class talking about. If there's anything that you don't understand, please let me know. Every 10 years, according to the Constitution of the United States, in Article 1, we have to do a census. What do we do during a census? 
Sorry? We survey people for what? What's the purpose? What's the main goal of the census? Population. We're counting, we're counting population. We're counting the population of each state. Why? Why is this in the Constitution? Why do we need to count the population of each state every 10 years? Or federal funding is one. What else? Because depending on your population, you might, your state might receive more money from the federal government. That's good. What else? There you go. You guys remember the Great Compromise, right? Where you, we have one house with equal representation. Which house would that be? The Senate with two representatives each. But we have one house that's based on what? Population. Is population going to stay the same? No. So we have to adjust. Every 10 years, we have to count the number of people living in each state so we can adjust the membership in the House of Representatives. Every 10 years, these number of representatives that each state gets in the House of Representatives changes. Every 10 years, some states gain seats in the House, and some states what? Lose seats in the House of Representatives. In 2000, the 2000 census, Texas only had 32 seats in the House of Representatives. But then we counted population again in 2010, and they gave us four more seats, so we have 36 seats now in the House of Representatives. But if one state gains a seat, that also means what? There's a constant number of 435 members in the House of Representatives, 435 seats available. If one state gains a seat, that means what? Another state will lose one. These states right here that are in yellow, they lost seats from 2000 to 2010 because their population didn't grow as fast as these states that are in blue. New York, who used to have the largest membership in the House of Representatives, has constantly been losing seats in the House because they're not gaining as much population as these western and southern states over here. Any questions so far? Who has the most membership in the House of Representatives? California, California with 53 representatives in the House. What matters in the House? What matters? Population. population. That's why we do a census every 10 years. In 2020, some of you will answer the census yourself because you're going to have your own household. It's important that you do because it decides how many representatives your state will receive in the House of Representatives. Any questions? So every 10 years we do a census and then we do something called reapportionment. What does apportion mean again? Distribute. What are we distributing? Representatives. Based on the state's what? Population. Bigger your state is the more representatives you're going to get. I think we're due to gain two more seats next, next year, 2020. So reapportionment is the allocation of seats in the House of Representatives depending on a state's population that we count in the census. All right, any questions so far? So each state gets a number of seats in the House of Representatives that is based on their population and that it is the responsibility of a state to do what we call redistricting. How many states are, how many representatives do we have in Texas for the House? 36, Then it is the responsibility of the state legislature, the state government, to then divide Texas into 36 districts. And this is how your, your state is divided. So redistricting means the drawing of district lines. The drawing of district lines. You need to know who's responsible because that's going to be important later on. State legislatures, the state congresses, the one that we have in Austin, our Texas Senate, our Texas House of Representatives, they're the ones that draw these lines. State legislatures draw the lines. I showed you a video about how crazy state legislatures were. They make state laws. Those are the ones that draw these lines. It's important that you know that because it's going to be important in a little bit. They do redistricting, which is the drawing of the lines. So here you can see 36 districts in the, in the state of Texas. Each district gets to elect how many representatives? What? Our district right here is District 15. Notice how oddly it's shaped. We'll talk about why. But this is District 15. Our representative is Vincente Gonzalez in the House of Representatives. And then each state gets to select one representative to be sent to the House of Representatives. Any questions? I'll, I'll answer that question right now. All right. There's rules about redistricting. You don't need to copy this down, but you need to remember it in your head. Number one, it has to be continuous. A district cannot be not contiguous. So what does that mean? Can this be a district? Yes, why? Because it's continuous. 
However, this cannot be one this year because it's not connected. Make sense? It has to be a continuous district. Second rule, they need to have approximately equal population. So she asked me why some are bigger than others. All of these districts have approximately equal population. This district right here has the same population as this district right there, that little purple one right there, approximately. It's just that they're not as dense here, the population is not dense, while in El Paso, the population is very dense. Make sense? All districts have to approximately have equal population. And then we'll talk about the last two in a little bit. All right, now let's talk about our main topic today, which is gerrymandering. I told you this before, who's, resp who's responsible for drawing those lines? The state legislatures. Whichever party controls the state legislature can draw these lines in a way to give an advantage to their party in national elections. Who we vote for at the state level affects the national elections, affects the national government. And you'll see how in a little bit. But the party who's in control of our state legislature gets to draw these district lines. And in 2020, they're going to get to draw it again. And they can affect elections at the national level. Anybody can predict who controls our state legislature, both houses in the Texas Congress is controlled by which party? Most people in Texas are what? Republicans. We're Republicans. So our Congress also reflects that. This is the Texas Senate with 31 members in the Texas Senate. 19 of them are Republicans, 12 of them are Democrats. So they have the majority in the Texas Senate. In the Texas House of Representatives, there's 150 members. Republicans have 83 of those seats, and Democrats have 67 of those seats. So both houses are controlled by the Republicans. So which party gets to draw these lines? The Republican Party gets to draw these lines. And this is where what we call gerrymandering happens. Gerrymandering is a perverted form of redistricting. Remember, redistricting is the drawing of district lines. These lines can be drawn in a way that would give your party an advantage during an election. So gerrymandering is the drawing of district lines to give one party an advantage during elections. The drawing of district lines to give one party an advantage. Alright. Have you ever wondered why our districts are so misshapen and oddly shaped, what you should probably predict is equal population squares and rectangles, but that's not what we have in the United States. In Texas alone, we have very weird shaped districts. And this is because of gerrymandering, because you can draw these lines in a way to give your party an advantage during an election. We have districts in the United States that look like these. They don't make any sense, but in reality, they do. They're, they're, they're drawn in a way to cheat the system. So let's gerrymander together. Let's pretend this is a state. This rectangular state right here is a state. There are a lot of Republicans living in the northern part of the state, a lot of Democrats living in the southern part of the state. Last census, this state was awarded five seats in the House of Representatives. So how many districts is the state legislature supposed to draw? Five. So we need to divide the state into how many districts? Five. Five. Remember the rules. It has to be continuous, and the population has to be approximately what? Equal. Equal. So let's pretend that each letter is one million people. So there's a million Republicans right here, a million Republicans right here, a million Democrats right here. Right? So each district, if we're going to divide this state by five districts, we'll have how many people? Sorry? Sorry, what? All right. <laughs> If we're going to divide this state into five districts, how many people will be in each district? Three. Three million. Three. 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 Everybody good? Everyone good so far? Yes. Count the number of Republicans living here. How many million? How many million or how many Republicans living there? Eight. Eight Republicans. How many Democrats living here? Seven. So there are more what than what? Republicans. There are more Republicans than Democrats. Correct? Very good? All right. 
So let's read this trick. Let's do it as, as fair as possible. Let's just do it up and down. This is going to be district 1, the first district of the state. District 2, the second district. Third district, fourth district, fifth district. This district right here, next election, who are they going to vote for? Republican. Because there's more what? Republican. There's more Republican living in that district. How about this district right here? Republican. Republican. This one? Republican. And the last two would vote what? Democrat. Democrats. So this state, next election, will send how many Republican representatives? Three, Three Republicans to how many Democrats? They will send two Democrats. Is that fair? No. It's kind of fair, right? Because there's only, there's more Republicans, right? Yeah. But a lot more or a little bit more? A little bit more. There's a little bit more, right? So three Republicans and two Democrats, that's not too bad. That's still proportional, that's still representative of the state. But you don't have to draw the lines that way, and that's the point I'm trying to make. You don't have to draw them straight up and down. Let's pretend this state legislature right now that's responsible for drawing these lines is controlled by Republicans. I want, instead of three Republican representatives and two Democrats, I want you to draw these lines in a way to give me four Republicans coming out of the state and only one Democrat getting elected. If you figure out first, you grab my marker, I'll give you 50 points on a quiz. I want four Republicans and one Democrat. Yeah, I was thinking about that. I see you my idea. That's good. Oh, and the rest are just. And the rest are just Dang. up and down. Mm -hmm. oh, uh, yeah. Let's check her ass. Yeah, I think just. Yeah, that's right. Wow, when that was was wrong, I would have cried. wow, I did not think of that. All yeah. right, did she obey all the rules? Are all the parts yes. the yeah. populations are the same? They're continuous. These three districts right here will vote for what kind of representatives? <laughs> Republican representatives. So three Republicans. How about this district? Republican. How about this one? Democrats. Democrats. Do one hard, it's also for 50 uh, points. You can't do it anymore. Oh. Let's say that this district, this state is controlled, the legislature is controlled by the Democrats instead. So I want three Democrats and two Republicans coming out of this state. Remember, there's less Democrats here, but we're gonna cheat and we're gonna give them more representatives in the House by drawing these lines. Three Democrats, two Republicans coming out of the state. No. You can go, you got it. I think I'm not sure. It was this one. I had it. Yeah, okay. Yeah, okay. Yeah, you're right. It's the same thing, yeah. Dang it, that's the one I had. Are you sure that? I'm not just wondering about it. I got it wrong. Boy, I'm sorry. That's about blinded. This is the first district right here? Yes. Yeah. This is the second district? Sir, it's because you don't fully erase. Oh. Okay. <laughs> fully erase. Okay. Okay. So this district right here? And fathers from the District one will vote what? Republican. Republican. This district will vote? Republican. Republican. This district is what? Democrat. 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 What? Yeah. Yes. Yes. Democrat, Democrat. Jesus, All right. Is that fair? Yes. yes. Not oh. really. Why is it fair? Is it more. representative of the population of the state? No. no, because there's more what? Republicans. There's more Republicans. But in this state, because we cheated, we got three Democrats out of it and two Republicans out of it. So this is what gerrymandering does to a state. Look what he did. And look what they did before. Your enemies, you need to put together. You need to clump them up. In this case, the enemies are the Republicans, right? So put them together in a district so that they don't affect the outcome, so they can't affect the outcomes of the other districts. So you put them together, you smudge them together in one district so that you prevent them from affecting the outcome of the other district, or the elections of the other districts. Does that make sense? Yes. That's what they did to you. <clears throat> and district 15, because our state legislature is controlled by Republicans. They put all the Hispanic liberals and Democrats together around the San Antonio area so that you don't affect the outcome of the other districts. So they're going to give this up. They're going to give up this district to who? 
Democrats. And the Democrats. Democrats. Uh, Ruben Hinojosa is a Democrat. And we're always going to have a Democratic uh, um, representative. This goes on forever. They clumped up their enemies so that they can win the other districts. Can you erase that? <laughs> no, I'm going to leave it there. <laughs> It bothers you every day. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yes. That's why they nice things. We have that's districts right. that look like this. They don't make any sense, but that's how they draw it. <laughs> this is probably the poster. This district is the poster child of gerrymandering. This is yes. Illinois' fourth district. This is in Chicago. And the only thing connecting this part so and this part yeah. is a little road. Oh, oh my like God. No but again, this is all about cheating, or not cheating, this is legal per se, but it's all about rigging the system so that your party gets an advantage. Any questions? All right, let's talk about the 14th Amendment again. Because it's going to be important. There's two cases that you need to know about gerrymandering and redistricting. And they all involve the 14th Amendment's Equal Protection and Due Process Clause. No state can deny anybody due process of law and equal protection of the law. What does a due process clause prevent the state from doing? States are not allowed to do what? They're not allowed to violate your Bill of Rights any longer. They have to respect your Bill of Rights. That's not what we care about today. Forget that. The last one is what we care about, the Equal Protection Clause. That prevents states from doing what? Discriminating, treating anybody unequally or unfairly, um, that would be a violation of the 14th Amendment. If a state does discrimination, it is violating the Constitution. It, specifically, it is violating the Equal Protection Clause of the 14th Amendment. Any questions? Equal Protection Clause prevents states from doing what? Discriminating. Keep that in your head as we go through these important Supreme Court cases that you need to know about for your AP exam. In 1962, we get the case Baker v. Carr. This is not about the House of Representatives in the United States, Congress. This is about Tennessee State Legislature. In the Tennessee State Legislature, they haven't done redistricting for almost 60 years. The last time they redistricted, it was in the turn of the century in 1901. So they haven't adjusted the district lines. So if you haven't redistricted in a while, what can you expect to happen? What's probably going to be the case for all the districts in Tennessee? The populations are going to be what? Different. They're going to be different. They're going to be unequal. Because some areas in Tennessee grew faster than other areas. There are cities, like in Memphis, Tennessee, that's growing really fast, so they're going to have more population. And then we get to the 1960s, and what they saw is there are some districts in Tennessee that have very, a lot of people, and there are some districts that have very, very few people. In some cases, I think, some districts are outnumbered 40 to 1. So we get unequally populated districts. What does that mean? If you have more people in your district, and they have less people in your district, how many representatives do you both get the in the state legislature? The same. You get the same. You get one. So my district with 5 million people gets one representative, and your district with 200,000 people get one representative. Who is that? Who is it not fair to? The, the bigger populated districts, right? Does that make sense? So for example, this, is not, this wasn't the case in Tennessee, but for example, if this district right here has 2 million people and this one only has 10,000 10, people, they both have one legislator, they, all, they both have one congressman. It's not fair for purple or red? Purple. It's not fair for purple. 2 million people are only represented by how many people? One. By one. And 10,000 people are represented by one. So that wasn't fair. So a lot of people were complaining. What are they going to base their complaint on? They complain to the Supreme Court. So it has to be about what? about the Constitution. They need to have a constitutional argument against Tennessee why they should be forced to do what again? Redistricting, redraw those lines. What's the constitutional argument? If you were a lawyer arguing for the people of Tennessee, how would you force your state to redistrict? 
Equal protection. Equal protection clause. What Tennessee is doing by not redistricting is what are they doing to a people? They're discriminating. Because this guy's vote doesn't, doesn't count as much as this guy's vote. Because he only gets how all of them gets how many representatives? One. You only get one. So my vote doesn't count as much as people from other districts because we both get one um, representative. Tennessee is discriminating on bigger populated districts. Any questions? Here's the problem the people of Tennessee have. There have been redistricting cases that were submitted to the Supreme Court before about gerrymandering and all of that. Because gerrymandering is an age-old tradition in the United States. Cheating has been going on for a while, since the 1800s. And when the Supreme Court comes across a case like that, they say, you know what, we can't take it. It's not justiciable, which means it cannot be settled by the Supreme Court. Because the Supreme Court answers what kind of questions? Constitutional, Constitutional questions. And they believe questions about redistricting, that's a political question. That's between Democrats and Republicans. The Supreme Court, the, the, the judicial branch, does not have a place for that. That's a political question. Let the Republicans and Democrats scramble against themselves. We only answer constitutional questions. So the problem the people of Tennessee have is when redistricting cases or gerrymandering cases gets brought up to the Supreme Court, the Supreme Court dismisses them and doesn't even hear them because they believe that's political questions. That's not a what kind of question? That's not a constitutional question. But the only thing that's going for the people of Tennessee right now is, this is not about Democrats or Republicans. This is about citizens in Tennessee being treated what? Unfairly and unequally, which is, should be a violation of what amendment? Oh, the 14th what clause? Equal protection, Equal protection clause of the 14th amendment. So Tennessee wasn't redistricting, this is what it's all about. Yes, redistricting. Well, how come it wasn't though? Aren't you well, supposed it's to? It's up to them. No, they don't, back then they don't have to. Oh, but it's now you do. Um, it depends whether or not your populations are. Uh, You'll see in a little bit. Yeah. All right. So the Supreme Court has to answer two questions: Can the Supreme Court take cases about redistricting? Does it have the right to rule on cases about redistricting? Because before ba um, Baker versus Carr, what was the Supreme Court's answer? Can we rule about redistricting? No. No, because that's a political issue. That's not a constitutional issue. So in this case, they have to answer. Does the Supreme Court have the right to rule over redistricting? And number two, were the people of Tennessee's um, equal protection rights, were they discriminated and, and treated unfairly by Tennessee by not redistricting? By allowing districts to have an equal population, were they being discriminated upon? The answer to both of these questions, according to the Supreme Court, is yes. The Supreme Court has the right to rule over redistricting if it has to do with what clause? The with the 14th Amendment Equal Protection Clause. If it has to do with a state drawing these lines to treat their citizens unequally and discriminating on one citizen over another, then they have the right to rule over it. It's a constitutional question. It's a justiciable dispute. And number two, yes, indeed, the state of Tennessee needs to redistrict because they, are, they have done discrimination against their citizens by not redistricting, by not drawing these lines in uh, these districts with equal population. All right, one thing you need to remember here, they established the doctrine of one person, one vote. That's why today, all districts must have approximately equal what? Equal population. Because if not, that could be constituted as what? That could be constituted as discrimination. I, and if it's discrimination, a state doing discrimination, it's against what clause? 14th. The 14th what? Equal EPC, protection. Equal Protection Clause. Any questions about that? You need to know the impact of this case. And this is what's probably important about Baker versus Carr. Before, people were afraid to bring up cases about redistricting to the Supreme Court because they have dismissed those cases for a while. But now, because of Baker versus Carr, it's going to open the door to equal protection challenges to redistricting. More and more people are going to challenge their state. Because now they can, if they can reason, their state is going against what clause? 
an equal protection clause. If they are, if their state is what? Discriminated. So before, people were very reluctant to submit redistricting cases to the Supreme Court because they have dismissed them for a while. But now, if they have an equal protection clause challenge to redistricting, they could. And as a result of this, since 1962, the Supreme Court has ruled on hundreds of cases about redistricting. Not hundreds, I'm exaggerating, but a lot of cases about redistricting. And a lot of states have been forced to redraw their lines to make sure they're not violating the Equal Protection Clause. So remember, this case opened the floodgates for redistricting challenges according to the Equal Protection Clause. And it's going to force a lot of states to redraw their lines to make sure they're abiding by the 14th Amendment. Any questions? All right. Next case. Shaw v. Reno. It's also about redistricting. This is more recent, 1993. Before we move on, you need to know what this means. Majority minority districts. Majority minority districts. In a majority minority district, that district is predominantly non what? If it's majority minority, it's non what? What's the majority ethnicity or race in the United States right now? Whites. So majority minority <laughs> districts. This means that this is a district with major predominantly non-whites. So where you have more minorities than whites in a district. More Hispanics or more African Americans in a district. Like our district, for example, would be considered majority minority because most of us here in the valley are not white. Any questions about that? This is about North Carolina and its redistricting. In the 1990s, after the census, North Carolina decided to redraw the lines. North Carolina, like us, we have a history of discrimination. And North Carolina is going to try to do the right thing here. And you'll see the story in a little bit. North Carolina redistricted. And what they found out once they redistricted is they only had one minority majority district. They only had one district that was predominantly non white. In this case, um, African American district. So they got scared. They thought the Supreme Court is going to come after them because they have a history of discrimination and they only made one minority majority district. So they decided, you know what, we need to do the right thing, we need to draw these lines again. We need to give more representation to black people in our state. So they decided to haphazardly redraw their lines to create one more minority majority district. So they're going to have two minority majority districts. They're overcompensating, basically, for the history of racism. Anybody can guess which district was that? <laughs> that purple one right there. <laughs> you see how it's so oddly shaped? Oh, yeah. That was the district that they were overcompensating. This is they created another predominantly African-American district in their state. So that they thought, oh, this is not going to bring us trouble because we're being cool. Yes. We're <laughs> At least they tried. Right? <laughs> uh, but then, white people in North Carolina decided to complain. Because they're redistricting. <laughs> they're drawing these lines based on what? Based on race. They're separating races by drawing these lines, which is what? Discrimination, that's another word for it though. Segregation. That's segregation. You're, you're segregating people, you're segregating voting blocks by drawing these lines. That's what they accuse North Carolina of doing. Segregating people according to, uh, by drawing these district lines. Everybody with me so far? Yes. All right, so the facts of the case, the state of Carolina added an oddly shaped majority minority district to try to improve representation for black people. Ruth Shaw, when she found out one of the citizens in North Carolina, a white citizen in North Carolina, complained, this is segregation. This is a state separating people by race. Which should be a form of discrimination, and if it's discrimination, it's against what? The 14th Amendment is what? Equal, equal protection clause. If it's a state discriminating, equal protection clause. So she was saying it was discriminating against the whites? Yes. Yeah, so without because they're drawing these lines based on race, 
and they're segregating people based on race. Which for her is a violation of the 14th Amendment Equal Protection Clause. Alright. But again, the original intention was a good thing for North Carolina, but they may have overcompensated. <coughs> Any questions so far? So this is about the Equal Protection Clause again. And this is what we call racial gerrymandering. Drawing these lines um, based on what? Based on race. And that's what, that's what North Carolina was doing. Drawing these lines based on race. That district was created purely because of race. Of course, the state of North Carolina did not admit to that at first. They said, oh, we draw these lines very randomly. <laughs> that's not why, that's not the intention. They didn't want to get in trouble. But here's what the Supreme Court has to answer. Did North Carolina draw the lines based on race? Number one. North Carolina said no. Uh, the Supreme Court is going to decide otherwise. And even if they did, is that a violation of the 14th Amendment's Equal Protection Clause? If they did draw the lines based on race, is that the state discriminating on its own citizens? That's the two questions they need to answer. Number one, did, the, did North Carolina draw the line based on race? And number two, if they did, is that a violation of the 14th Amendment's Equal Protection Clause? Is that discrimination? All right, let's go to the ruling. Supreme Court justice, according to the opinions that made by the Supreme Court, the district is so oddly shaped, there is no other explanation for it than they were dividing people based on what? Based on race. It's so oddly misshapen that there's no other explanation for it other than they're dividing people based on race. And yes, indeed, doing that, racial gerrymandering or racial redistricting is discrimination, it is segregation, it is a violation of the 14th Amendment's Equal Protection Clause. So North Carolina was forced to redraw their districts again. <coughs> So the key thing that you need to take away here is racial gerrymandering, racial redistricting, unconstitutional. Because it is segregation. It is dividing people based on race. So racial gerrymandering is unconstitutional today. If the state of Texas decides to purely redistrict based on race, then it would be considered um, in violation of the 14th Amendment's Equal Protection Clause. It would be unconstitutional to do. Any questions? All right, let's review. Baker versus Carr. Tennessee hasn't redistricted for their state legislatures in a while, which resulted in <coughs> districts having an equal what? An equal first. First, they have an equal what? They have an equal population, which results in an equal representation. So they complain that their vote doesn't count as much as people from another district's vote. So they said that this is their state discriminating upon them, which is a violation of what? 14th Amendment Equal Protection Clause. Did the Supreme Court agree? Yes, they did. Um, they said that each district should have approximately equal what? Population. They, they established the doctrine of what? One person, one? One vote. One person, one vote. Um, and that having an equally populated districts would be discrimination, and that is a violation of the 14th Amendment's Equal Protection Clause. But what's the importance of Baker versus Carr? It's going to allow people, it's going to inspire people to bring up cases about what? Redistricting. As long as they have reasoning that their state discriminated upon them or violated the 14th Amendment's Equal Protection Clause, now they can bring up a case to the Supreme Court. Shaw versus Reno, state of North Carolina, created a majority minority district. It was oddly shaped, based entirely on race. White people complained. Uh, did, was the district created based on race? Yes, yes it is. Is that allowed? No. no, because that would be a state dividing people based on what? Race, race which is equivalent to segregation, which is discrimination, which is against what amendment? The 14th Amendment's Equal Protection Clause, so no racial gerrymandering or racial segregation. Do they complain because... Because the population of the state does, if you do the proportion, it shouldn't have two districts predominantly African-American. 
Alright, lastly today, we'll cover this tomorrow. How many minutes do we have left for? things. I graded your finally your FRQ essays. Some of you didn't do too well. That's fine. Unlike your homework, I can give you full credit as long as you fix them and then show them to me. So make sure you keep... I'm going to post a video today that should help some of you. If you're struggling, I'll post a video about the, the FRQ assignment so that you can fix it. You have until this week to do that. So make sure that you come in. Don't wait until Friday to do so because you might have to fix something that takes a long time and you're not going to be able to do it. So make sure that you show up starting tomorrow, starting uh, today afternoon, and then tell me what you're missing and tell me how you fix your stuff. It's now Skyward, it should be on the thing though.